coming in hot on a Friday, Chich. What's going on, man? Is your head spinning right now with the uh, draft? Oh, I'm exhausted. Thanks, everybody. I got to give a thanks on air to Sean. He let me sleep in a little this morning. Dude, I didn't go to, I didn't actually, I text you, I'm like, I'm pretty much done, I need to sleep in a little, I text you at like 12.15 in the morning, I didn't get to bed, there was still stuff I had to do, I didn't get to bed till like 1.45 this morning, <laughs> but it was fun, dude, oh my god, draft, the draft is so stupid, <laughs> as far as like, how much they hype it up with all the like, pomp and circumstance and all the BS, but it was really fun, it's like really fun to like, do the work on it, because like, as long, when you're watching it, those picks go very, you know, they take a while, it feels like. But when you're trying to, like, analyze it and do stuff, you only have those, like, 10 minutes at a time to, like, knock out a segment we were doing last night, whatever. But I was with uh, uh, Trey Wingo and, and Matt Castle and Chuck Pagano. Chuck Pagano, former coach, one of the coolest dudes. Is he? he says the word dude. I love when anybody over the age of 60 uses the word dude a lot. They're usually a cool right. guy. <laughs> and he is. <laughs> But we actually kind of had a blast. Like, this whole, you know, the remote world is a lot different than being in a studio and sitting there all night, which there's there's fun to that, too. But, like, we're all sitting around, and, like, we're sitting in our homes watching our TVs and then yeah. knocking out segments. It's a, it's a very unique time that's, in this industry right now. But, that's really... Um, was there anything in the draft that they were, you know, surprised about? Was, you know, any pick that they were like, whoa? Well, it's not... It's not the... Well, the the Texans trading it back and having two top five picks was pretty badass. Like that was kind of the most legit thing. Um, and we actually had Ian Rappaport. Did, you know Ian Rappaport, the NFL insider? Yeah, yeah. We went to we went to college together. <laughs> you and he, did you know him? Dude, he was like a little brother to me. He 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 was like uh, he wound up becoming the editor of the Columbia Spectator newspaper sports part of the newspaper, which is a pretty big deal. And you know for Columbia. He's, the editor of their newspaper. It's an English and comparative literature school, a journalism school. But um, yeah, dude, he's a couple years younger than me. I, I, I've, I've known him since he was 18 wow. years old. And we had him on like three weeks ago. I texted him like, hey, you want to hop on with us? He nailed the fact that he's like, I think the Texans are going to move and try to get two top five picks, which does not happen. That's like unheard of. And he nailed it. And they did. Um, the craziest thing right now is... Uh, Oh my god, I'm I'm so punch drunk. I'm forgetting his name. The dude that didn't get drafted last night. Uh, oh, Levi's. Well, uh, Levis. <laughs> Levis. <laughs> Will Levis. Yeah, yeah. Dude. Uh, well, the, it's a that's the, a locked time. I am <laughs> to that guy. Levi's. Levi's is a cool last name. The thing is, what what's your take on this? This is the thing for me. What the guys go to the draft. The guys who are there. This happened to Matt Liner years ago, but like. Every time a pick goes through, they just cut to the guy who's sitting there with his girlfriend and with his mom, and they just cut to his face every time he doesn't get picked. I, I don't love that. I think that's kind of, like, cheesy to do. And you yeah. start feeling bad for the guy. I don't know. What's your take and, on it? And, well, listen, the guy also knows the camera's on him. Right. Like, that's an uncomfortable feeling. So it's like, hey, you know, shoot the Levis. See what his reaction is. Right. Like, and yeah, he's got to be like, like yeah, yeah, that's like when the Academy Awards, when, uh, when somebody wins and you always see the meme of the person that's pissed when they didn't win <laughs> and the other guy and they get, they get destroyed for like weeks. Yeah. It's hard, dude. It's hard being on. People don't really understand how strange it is to be on camera and how much more concentration it takes to not make faces and stuff right you've you probably you yeah. you've been doing this for 15 years now i'm i'm doing it now i still struggle with it every time we point yeah. this camera at us it's not yeah, an easy no. thing well i think and that's you know if you know you're going to be on a segment or something that's different than like when they're panning into you exactly. and they're like hey you're on camera you know and you're not like have a mic yeah. or anything like that it's a different story yeah you know what is relatable like people now who have like zoom meetings at home where like your boss is talking to you and says something yeah. you don't agree with, you got to pretend to not make not make a mad face and just, just yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just stare. If I'm ever in a meeting with like an executive, I just stare at the dot on my computer and just stare at it. Try not to make any faces. <laughs> um, anyway, so what are you up to? What do you got? You what do you well, got? What do you got going on? You're back well, I'm going. I'm going to Cleveland this weekend. Jillian's got a uh, volleyball tournament, so we're heading up there today, nice. right after school. That's cool. And, uh, yeah, and then I'm doing that all weekend. Then Jake's playing, and it's the volleyball tournament's in Cleveland. 
Jake's at obviously at Kent State, which is like 30 minutes away. So I'm going to try and like volleyball, baseball games all weekend long. You know? Nice, just like man. boom, 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 back and forth. Nice. So That's dad. See if I can hit them all. Dad life. Yeah, what are you doing? What am I doing this weekend? I'm working. The draft goes to tomorrow. That's right. You got the draft. Yeah. yeah but it's all right. Um, yeah. Hey, speaking of. Dude, oh, what were you going to say? Yeah, I, I, no, I was going to say, like, speaking of that, like, you know, obviously you're a big Yankee fan too. Like, what did you think about Judge coming out of the game? Uh, I mean, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Especially like, well, you can relate to this more than I can. Like, I feel like the bigger a guy is, the more scared I get about an injury. You know, like if you get a hamstring and you're six foot six, that's a bigger hamstring than if you're five foot seven. I always get worried by the big guys. And he's, he did get hurt. You know, he's been hurt a couple times in his career. Luckily, he's kind of hung in there for the most part. But dude, that, that team is nothing without Judge. They're not, you know, they're not playing the greatest they could possibly play anyway. You get, right. you take Judge out of that lineup. What's your lineup? It's not, it's not even close. It's not even close. It's not scary. Harold Harold Reynolds did a demo the other night. I thought it was a great demo on on sliding head first. Oh, because you thought Judge slid head first the other day. It was like the most oh, awkward head bounced. first slide. Yeah, like his hand got caught under, like he like rolled over. Like it just was awkward. Like, yeah. dude, how many guys? I mean, Mike Trout broke his finger a couple of years ago. I mean, how many guys nowadays? Now they got these oven mitts yeah. they're all wearing. You know, these big oven mitts. Yeah. Like, Looks yeah. like they're going to take out the freaking sea bass out of the oven or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. But, like, but, dude, back in the day, Pete Rose, head first slide. Oh, yeah. Ricky Henderson, oh, Ricky, head first the slide. Master. Like, do you ever remember them breaking their fingers? Like, I'm saying, like, no. nowadays, these guys slide, and I think head first, I wasn't the greatest head first, you know, <laughs> slider or whatever, but I think it's more of like getting your hands in, the, get your arms up. Right. These guys are sliding with their hands down, and they're jamming their fingers and they're breaking them. So, like, Judge the other day, like yeah. Aaron Judge, dude, if you can't slide head first, do not do it. That's a do great, not. That's a great point. It's like it's like being a guitarist. It's the same thing. What, what are you? How, what are you as a hitter without your hands? It's the yeah. most dangerous thing in the world. You might as well tie them to yourself. Like it's like it's like a catcher putting his hand behind his back, like because yeah. you don't want it in front. You're already every time you step to the plate, you're in danger of breaking a hand. So why right. why add to that? Uh, that's great a- point, dude. Great point. Why put it in danger, dude? I just you just triggered a you just triggered a, a great story really quick. Love it. To go off on a small tangent. Okay. I'm I'm seeing Pearl Jam in Cincinnati, bro. Like a few years back. And they're on a break and I'm on the side. I'm, you know, going to the backstage and you know, I come up on Matt Cameron, their drummer. And Matt Cameron's like, Hey, what's up, Case? I'm like, hey, what's up, Matt? How you doing? Why well, yeah, you know me, dude. I just give him a nice handshake. Well, dude. Matt's not the biggest dude. He's like, you know, he's a little dude, you know, but oh. one of the best drummers ever, right? So right. I shake his hand, boom, I'm I'm on my way to the back, you know. And then at the uh at the end when I go to go backstage, Pete, the security guard, who's a great friend, a great friend of mine, but yeah. bodyguard, just he's the muscle for Pearl okay. Jam. Like <laughs> awesome. you don't get near Ed or anybody yeah. without going through Pete, right? Wow. So Pete kind of stops me on the way into the Locker room in the back. He's like, Case. He's like, hey, man. He goes, from now on, just give the guys daps. I go, what do you mean? He goes, Matt Cameron thought you broke his hand in the middle oh. of the show and that he was going to not not be able to go on stage and finish the show. And I was like, what? And so next thing you know, I go backstage and Ed's like, dude, I heard you almost broke Matt, Matt's hand. I'm like, oh my are you serious? God. Dude? I was like, I had no idea. I just shook his hand. Were you and terrified? Like, did, did you, you must have felt terrible. Sean Casey. Well, dude. Oh. It was, Ed was joking around. He's like, bro, if we lose Matt Cameron, we're going to lose millions. Like, holy crap, it's true. But I'm saying, their hands are everything. He's the drummer, dude. They're, they're everything. Like, yeah. I was like, oh, my God, he's right. So now do I just come in with, like, daps or a light hug to the Pearl Jam? I don't want to hurry. Holy anybody. moly. You want to know a secret? <laughs> you want to know a really cool secret? There's yeah. a pressure point in your hand. So, you know, if, like, let's just say you don't like somebody and you want to shake their hand really hard. If If I shake your hand... And I take my middle finger and I put, when I'm shaking your hand, I press onto your wrist yeah. right where I'm pressing right now. You, you will not be able to grip my hand hard. It's a fact. I'm, I'm telling you. Seriously? Yes. Do it with Sarah so when, like when you're Je- done with Jedi this. Jedi mind trick? You just come in when you're shaking people's hands, just hit them right in the wrist? When, when, when you get off this, is Sarah around today? When, or whatever. Whoever you yeah. have in your house. Have, yeah. Tell them you're going to shake their their hand is like really hard, but tell them to ha- put their middle finger on your palm right here. And I guarantee you won't be able, even if it's Jillian, I guarantee you won't be able to grip 
well, maybe you, you'll probably you'll probably fly through it with Jillian, but like, you, you can't grip hard enough like that. My buddy right, Jamie, I'll, I'll a former cop, that. taught me that. He's all about pressure points and stuff like that. Like he taught me, uh, you know the uh, the big thing cops do is they grab your love love handle and twist it. If somebody twists your love handle, you will you will go directly to the ground. How cool is what, that? What are they What are they going to do if they're arresting a bodybuilder or something? That's a good point. Yeah, that's that's a good advantage. <laughs> The other thing they do is if, if somebody's holding a gun, if you hit somebody, if you hit somebody right on the on the side of the wrist, their hand their hand their hand will open, and that's how you knock a, a gun out of somebody's hand. I'm not risking that, dude. What if I went for the karate chop? It doesn't do it. And the guy's like, "You're dead." <laughs> I'm like, "Kids told me on the podcast if I hit the guy in the wrist, the freaking gun comes open." Wow, we've gone yeah. down another rabbit yeah. hole as we do. All right, hey, let's get back to baseball. We so said we're gonna get hot yeah. on baseball. So what? Well, we got Judge. What do we about we go to Otani? Let's go to Otani. Roughed yeah. up a little what bit. Do you, what do you think, Chinch? I mean, what do you think of Otani, dude? I, I think I think like he's he's must watch. Back to Harold. I'm sorry to bring give him so many props, but his biggest point he always used to say is the superstars are the guys that you stop to watch. You stop to watch. Anytime if I if I turn the TV on and I'm flipping through the channels and I see Otani, my hand stops. Even if somebody's yeah. just talking about him, if he's not playing, I'm like, oh, what did he do now? What did he do now? Like, he is the, like, I honestly, I, we, we made the joke about doing the Otanis. I'm shocked we don't see more of him. Like, if I were Major League Baseball, I know he is on, like, the front of all their posters, but I would just be throwing Otani imagery all over the world, like, everywhere. There should be Otani, you should be able to buy an Otani jersey at a Pirates game. <laughs> like, I, I don't see why not, because he he's bigger. I'm not saying he's bigger than a game, because his respect for the game is amazing, but... What no matter what he does, good, bad, or ugly, I'm watching. What what do you think? Yeah, I agree, dude. It's it's must see TV, and there's obviously he's a unicorn, but but I think the I think the WBC even elevated him more. Where like us as fans are like, dude, Otani's on TV, I'm watching. And I think even if you're not like you know, even talking to Pat McAfee when he was like, dude, he's like, I don't really watch baseball games, but but seeing Otani come in, the, you know, Japan versus US, I'm locked in. So it's like. There's something about his presence, uh, you know, being the two-way player and the incredible player that he is. Yeah. And I and think that really has has all of us intrigued, agreed. even if you're not a baseball fan. Agreed. Well, that's great. That's what I was going to go to right there. Is like, to make money uh, as, a, as a league, as a professional league, you're going to have your diehard fans. You make your money off the casual fans. You know, right. like, uh, you know, a husband or a wife who doesn't like baseball, but the other the other person does – that person knows who Otani is right now. And we haven't, you know, we really even remember like three or four years ago, there was a whole argument about like Trout is still, Trout could, I would even say today, he could walk down some streets and might not get recognized. And he's one of the great, I would say uh, top 10 player of all time, p- possibly. I think you could make that argument. Otani's, Otani, I feel like is more of in that like Jordan esque type of stratosphere, especially, I mean, like the global influence. It's like, remember when Yao, Yao was a great basketball player for the Houston Rockets. He built, he, he made American NBA basketball even bigger than it was. And that's why it's so international now is because Yao came over and he brought that whole fan base over. Yao Ming. Yao Ming. Yeah. 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 Similar, similar type thing. But the thing is, the crazy thing is, Otani hitting and pitching has even eclipsed how big like Ichiro, Ichiro, what was it, Ichi Mania, Ichiro Mania, right? You know, that's so true. That's so true. Yeah, I, I was at the 2001 All Star Game uh, in Seattle. It was like Ichiro Mania that when when he won right. the MVP and, and uh, oh, hang on, yeah, you flash a little. Um, you, go. you good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, when he when when back in 2001, he won the MVP, won the Rookie of the Year, but it was like so crazy. I think you're exactly right. It's just it's at a different level with this guy because we've never seen anything like it. He's, you know, each row yeah. could hit this guy hits one of the best hitters and one of the best pitchers in the game. It's just, it's amazing. Dude, but I, yesterday, go ahead, you go know, ahead. almost hitting for the cycle, you know, what do you do? Pitch six innings, yeah. got the win. He got the win. Didn't have his best outing, but he punched a bunch of tickets, some nasty stuff, but he almost hit for the cycle. He I had know. the single double and the triple out of the way, hit a bomb his last at bat. The freaking broadcast went crazy. Place came to their feet, and uh, he ended up flying out literally to the fence. Guy, you know, center fielder into the fence, caught it. Incredible. Oh my God, dude, I got a quick thing that popped into my head. This is 
an image I will never, <laughs> it's burnt into my head. The, uh, back when I was with, with you guys at the network, one of my favorite things to do with the All-Star game was me and Kaiafa and uh, one of the camera crews, we would get exclusive access to the locker rooms when the guys got in. And I, and, I, and uh, we were sitting in there one day, and this was Ichiro. <laughs> I loved Ichiro. Ichiro's one of my favorite players ever. I, I just loved him. I loved everything about him. I love how cool yeah. he is and everything. Um, and he, and I'm like, oh man, that's Ichiro over there. And I'm just, I'm just like, kind of like leaning up against one of the couches, just kind of trying to stay out of the way, trying not to bother guys like you. And I say, like, Ichiro, he's getting changed. And this is, you know, <laughs> he's getting changed. And he pulls his pants down and he was wearing a pink thong, bro. He <laughs> was. <laughs> I mean, thong. <laughs> Like, like you see on a Brazilian beach, like or like up a, the crack, thong. yeah, or like an Italian guy, you know, smuggling grapes across the uh, across the, <laughs> the Naples Valley. I'll never forget it. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I'm com- I'm I'm comfortable enough in my sexuality to tell this story because I thought, on the one hand, I was like, what? On the other hand, I'm like, well, that's somebody who's extremely confident in themselves. <laughs> He's in, you know, like Albert Pujols is in there, like some of the biggest dudes, Tomei's walking around. And Ichiro, first of all, by the way, I swear that dude couldn't have weighed more than 133 pounds. I swear. I don't care what his number said. He was like so skinny and he's just walking around in his thong. I was dying. I can't dude, believe I talk just about, told him. Dude, that's so great. And talk about like you're saying he's not the biggest of dudes and he's wearing thongs. <laughs> now they say he had some of the most power in batting practice right? you've ever seen like could crush the ball. Dude, I got a great story at first base one time. We're playing the Tigers, 2007. Each row hits a chopper, comes flying down the line, dude. I think Verlander barehanded it, threw it to me, boom, we get him. And, you know, as a first baseman, you can feel the base. So you can usually, whatever that feeling is, you can feel safer out. Right. And that's why you'll, you'll, you'll get a guy, a uh, first baseman, who challenge it right away. He knows by the touch of the base. He's not seeing it, but he feels it. Ichiro comes down the line, bro, but he is safe by a step. And the ump's like, he's out. Uh, right? And yeah. so Ichiro looks at the ump like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I'm like throwing it around, but and I'm like, oh my God, like this, he was <laughs> definitely safe. Ichiro, instead of going over to the dugout, comes over to me and stands next to me. He's like, hey, Case. He's like, tell the ump. Tell the ump. <laughs> we start having a conversation with me. Like, Tell the up, I would say. Which, by the way, he, he goes, spoke good English, even when he wasn't yeah. speaking English, right? Yeah. yeah, he did speak good English. But tell the up, I would say. I was so uncomfortable, dude. I didn't know what to do. I was like, uh, uh. I just walked off. He's like, tell him. So I start walking out. I was like, tell him, tell him. You know I was safe. He knows it. You know it. I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. That's <laughs> funny. That's funny. Did you ever have any other? That's a great story. Are there any yeah. other stories like that around first? Like, you ever... You oh, ever, dude, I got a million of them. Oh, I got, a, whoa, whoa, I got a question. What happens when a guy you hated got to first base? <laughs> dude, there wasn't the, the one. I remember the one one conversation. Uh, you know, one of the ones you really remember, like, were there any jerks? I, I don't know if there was any jerks, but I remember one time in Montreal. Remember Milton Bradley? Yeah, yes. Very Milton Bradley unique didn't person. have the best reputation. Yeah, <laughs> oh, little man. Whatever, you know, me, he, Milton, who was who he was, but or is who he is, he he um got his first big league hit in Montreal. And it was like my probably my fifth year in the big leagues at the time. And uh, he comes to first, and I'm like, hey, man. Yeah, it come, popped up on the board. For, congratulations, Milton Bradley, first big league. And I'm like, dude, congratulations, man. You'll never forget that. You know, it's such, such a great moment. You know, I always remember mine, too. He didn't say a word to me. <laughs> Not a word. I'm like, uh, is this guy serious? I'm like, I'm like. Bro, do you, is that your 2000, 3000 kid or your first kid? I'm just wondering. <laughs> That's good. Wait, I got another one. I got another one. What about when guys would get to first base when you either know you're about to fight or when you have just had a fight and you didn't get kicked out of the game and and the intensity is out of control? Then then you then even if a friend goes to first, do you not talk to them? Like you got to just uh, yeah, yeah. Even if your buddy's there, you're not talking to them. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been there before in a couple of situations where, like, there was just a bench clear, and and now you're back. Yeah, you're back at it. It's very, very awkward. But I remember in Colorado when Scott Sullivan hit Brian Hunter, and we came out. I think I've talked about this before. But boom, bench is clear. It comes Brian Hunter, Scott Sullivan throwing haymakers. I'm running up at the day game in Colorado, dude. It was like a, a 
avalanche of people. Ha. I look to my left. I'm about to get to the fight. Like, I'm right there. I'm about to. I don't even know what the hell I'm going to do, but I'm about <laughs> to get there. And all of a sudden, dude, like, the whole bench of the Rockies tackles me, and I'm at the bottom of the pile. Dude, it was scary. Remember, it's like, Todd Helton's on top of here, a couple other guys, and I'm just like, oh. And, like, it's those are scary moments. But I remember when that broke up, and it was very tense. There was legit punches thrown in that one. It wasn't like, you know, break it up. Yeah. And I remember when it, when, it, when it started back up again, when I was back at first, it was like just the air was tense with the Ooh. Rockies and in the crowd. And yeah, it's, it's an eerie feeling when the theme gets going again. That, that reminds me of a story I remember when, when, you know, being a Yankee fan back in the day, Jeter was younger. So it was like 97, 98. So it was like second or third year. And, you know, him and A-Rod back then, they were like buddy, buddy. Everybody thought they were best friends, even though I don't think they ever really were. But uh, the... Where, where was A-Rod playing at the time? It was, oh, Seattle and the Yankees get into like a, a hardcore brawl. And I remember Chad, remember Chad Curtis? Yeah. Tough, Chad Curtis. tough nose player, but like a little like military, like kind of, kind of like a little different kind of bird. But so they get into this brawl and off to the side, A-Rod and Jeter are just standing there while like it was kind of breaking up. And they pretend, they like pretended to like, throw punches, you know, they kind of like shadow box and like smiled for a minute. And yeah. after the game, Chad Curtis called Jeter out. I don't know if this is, I, I'll find the article, but Chad Curtis called Jeter out. And by the, by the next year, Curtis was gone. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know, you don't call Jeter out. <laughs> no, but like, you know, to a degree, like for what you're talking about, it's like, Hey man, we're, we're in the middle of this. Everybody's cleating each other in the ears, trying to, trying to rip each other's noses off. And you guys can't be playing around on the side. Right. It's yeah. Like, no, that's tired. A little etiquette. I I would have said the same thing, dude. You can't be like playing around, joking around with your buddy. Like those bench clears are real, dude. That, that, it's 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 scary. You, know, like, you feel like you're in a battle royal with like you're like this is what it must feel like in WWE to <laughs> yeah. be a battle royal. But yeah. real guys are really punching each other. Yeah, it's an actual fight. That's why hockey drive. Like it is unbelievable that hockey guys fight and then they like hug after, or, like high five each other after punching yeah. each other directly in in, in head. Yeah, and, they got the sticks going. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, hey, everyone's great, like great. hey, good and job, like, guys. Guys are bloody. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're like, I think the same thing. It's so weird. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's so weird. That's why I have a, I have a little cousin who's like, uh, he's into hockey. And I'm like, he's never going to, he's never going to have to worry about getting into a fight. These kids love fighting. It's crazy. Yeah. Hockey, incredible. hockey guys are built from a different little. Dude, they're, they're, those guys are nuts. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. a lot of them are actually more my size than your size, obviously. Oh, dude. Yeah. Uh, and also too, Chris Chelios is a buddy of mine. Chelios is, Chelios probably 58. Takes his shirt off right now. He's yoked. Like, and, and I remember going to the Penguin Clubhouse, like Sid Crosby, Rupper, uh, all these guys. I mean, every hockey guy, you could see every single muscle they have, dude. They're yeah. freaking all ripped. Yeah, Dude, Rupper, Rupper is a big scare. One of the nicest men. I love that dude, guy. But the best. just his build. He's not. He's built almost like, a, like an Olympic swimmer. And yeah. he's, <laughs> you, you, am I right? Like he is Great call. humongous and looks like he could be one of the scariest people on earth. That dude, dude I, mean, I, I went down one cause I was buddies with Rupp. I went down to Penguins practice one time and dude, Rupp's like six, five with no skates on dude with skates on. He's like six, eight. Oh, so big. Right. Yeah. He told me a story one time. He was kind of an enforcer too. Yeah. He told me a story one time. He's like, Hey, he goes, Casey, I go, dude, tell me, tell me some fighting stories. You know, all that <laughs> stuff. He's like, what's what a cool one. He said one time, I think he was with the Devils, and um, and uh, you know there was a, a guy came up to him on the ice and w came up to him and was like, "Hey man," he goes, "Can you fight me tonight?" And Rob's like, "What do you mean?" He's like, <laughs> "He goes, I'm about to get sent down. I'm not really doing anything. I'm not scoring. I'm not getting any assists. Like, I need to do something. If you could fight me, I'd appreciate it." <laughs> Rob's like, "Listen, I'll, I'm going to kick your ass, but I'll fight you." So, dude, like next thing you know, they go up. Next they come back the, around the face off. Boom! They drop the gloves and they go at it. Rub said he got the better of this dude, <laughs> but he said the guy fought. And like it looked like, like he did something, but how cool is that for the guy to be like, and I'm like, about to get you. sent out of here. <laughs> Any chance we could fight real quick on the face off? <laughs> thanks for kicking my ass, man. Thanks. I really appreciate yeah, thanks. you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for beating the shit out of me. That's awesome. <laughs> it's so funny. And the other thing about fights is like people, do, like if you've never been hit in the face, it is one of the most stunning, jarring, emasculating, horrible things that you could ever experience in your life. It's more mentally triggering than it even than even hurting you. Just it's one of the most shocking experiences. Because look at me, little Italian jerk. Clearly knows what it's like to get punched in a mouth. 
<laughs> anyway. You've been punching people kids a lot, haven't you? You, no, you, I, and, your, you and your cousin. I just bite ankles. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, my, my biggest line whenever things are getting nasty, I, I would go, you, you might take, you might, you might win, but I will hurt you. You will be hurt. You're going to kill me, but I will hurt you in some way <laughs> if this ever happens. I don't condone fighting though, nor do you. Right. Oh, we're, gonna... we're not those no. kind of people. All right. Not in the mayor's house. We don't <laughs> Speaking of fighting, one last thing before we go. Like, we need to see some fight out of the Chicago White Sox. Dude, what is going on with that franchise right now? Dude, you know, you, 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 you hate that. As a player, I would always look at the season and go, okay, I break it down into 100 at bats, you know, 100 bats a month. And as a team, you're like, okay, you know, let's look at every month. Well, coming out the gates, you know, anytime you come out the gates, the way the whites, what are they, seven and nineteen or something ridiculous? Yeah, seven and eighteen, seven and nineteen. They are something seven like that. and nineteen. I mean, you're right, seven and nineteen. Yeah, when you're coming out the gates, seven and nineteen, you're really playing bad baseball. Tim Anderson, your best player, is on the shelf. Pedro Grafal, who I love, Pedro's a great guy, great manager. Like first year managing, like the the look isn't bad. The look is bad right now. Like when you come out the gates this cold, seven and nineteen. It just is so glaring that you, you know, you're, you're you're asking Ken Williams, hey, you're going to do something here, but like, yeah. I think at the end of the day, it's a, it's a long, it's a marathon. But the the problem with the White Sox, they're not playing good baseball. Like they're not like, oh man, they're in the games. They're like they're out of a lot of games. Like they're not pitching right. well. They're not swinging the sticks. They're they're not doing anything well. So, it, you know, yeah, they got nothing you, to hang their hat on. There's like not yeah. one thing to be like, let's build yeah, off of. You got it, and, and I think the White Sox too, chance like last year, we're like, oh. Tony LaRue's, they're going to be just so good. And that, that didn't work out. They kind of faltered most of the year and made a little run at the end, but they couldn't catch the, the Guardians. You know, now it's like, okay, this is, I mean, most of the most of the analysts or whoever, the, the experts pick the White Sox. Okay, they're going to be back this year. They got too good of a team. They, they're too loaded top to bottom. <clears throat> they're going to be really good. Seven and nineteen, bro. Yeah. Twenty six games into the year. Yeah, I, I got. Let me let me give you one positive though, because this is really cool. This is good leadership. Uh, Rick Hahn, did you see his quote? No. So obviously, it's like your team sucks. Blah, blah, blah. He's probably been hearing that. Here's a quote: "Put it on me. That's the job. It's the absolute gig." Uh, and then referring to the manager, he goes, "Let's make this real clear. It sure as heck isn't on Pedro." And his coaching staff. They're doing everything in their power to prepare, focus on what's controllable, what's fixable, addressing the problems as they arise. And they are really doing everything in their power to get this thing right. It's absolutely not on the manager and the coaches. Man, you got to love hearing that from a, from your GM, dude, huh? I, I, great leaders lead from the front, dude. And when you hear that from Rick Hahn, you're like, hey, listen, man, I put the team together. Pedro Grafal is my guy. And I love, like I said, I love Pedro. I think he's the right guy for the job. They're just not playing good baseball right. at the end of the day. If this, if they got off to a hot start and this is July, you're not blinking. Mm. You're not blinking. Mm. But you start blinking in the first month when you're 7-19. and 19. They were 7-19 and 19 in July, and they were like, oh, they're right around 500. You'd be like, right. all right, man, you're, they're still where they want to be. Because it's April, it's just a bad look. So I understand what Rick Hahn's saying because think of this, Chinch. There's still 136 games to go. Mm -hmm. So – they, any team can make a run, and I feel like the White Sox have the ability to do it. Oh, forget it. Oh, good. I love a good run at the end of the year, though, right? You love a team that yeah. was down like they were eight games out. That used to happen to the Mets. The Mets and the Phillies used to do that to each other all the time, like eight yeah. games out last month and a half. And then the, the, It's amazing. It's amazing how it can turn around, but think about how much you have to win and somebody else has to lose to turn around that many games. It's It's like... It's borderline yeah. impossible at times, but well, you, yeah, you don't want to get in a hole like that. But the one thing is too, like, <clears throat> I think the the AL Central again is going to be up for grabs. You know, nobody's running away with it now. The Twins are, are playing well. The, the, the they're around five hundred. The, the Guardians are around five hundred. So yeah. nobody's running away with that. So you know, for the White Sox, that they're, they're in the right division to have to make a run. Yeah, but but one real quick back to your. Uh... Your point about breaking the season down into a bats, whatever. Do you do? I've been watching because the Knicks are good. <laughs> I've actually been watching playoff basketball, yeah. and like I'm always like really concerned. Like the 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 three minutes right before halftime, if if let's just say you're up by like nine, in in a split second, like somebody hits a three, whatever, and then you go into the locker room, you're up by six. Did you? Would you like? Let's just say you start playing better the, the, the towards the end of the first half, right before the All Star break. Are you like? 
Would you literally sit around with the guys and be like, man, if we can cut, let's cut, let's get it to six by the break. That's our goal. Get it to six by the break because in the second half we can go. Do you think that far in advance or you don't, don't really? Well, I, I, I do think for baseball players, you watch how many guys will have bad first half, dominate the second half. How many teams will have bad first half, dominate the second half. There's something mentally about baseball getting to that all-star yeah, break. Just a reset. I know for me sometimes, some of my years I had terrible first halves, I'd have some of my best second half best halves of baseball ever because I'm like, it's a new, new season, mm. you know, new season. So yeah, I do think guys think that, Hey, listen, let's get somewhere where we need to get before the all-star break and let's start fresh in the second half and see if we can make a run. I think guys do think that way. I love it. All right. All right. You got to get to uh, Cleveland. You're going to go to the rock and roll hall of fame. Let's go, baby. You, um, have you ever been? I've been there a bunch of times. Probably not overrated, underrated, or just rated. Uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's, it's a little. <laughs> I think it's a little overrated. A little overrated. I wish they had more stuff. I think they had. I wish they had more memorabilia there. Oh, okay. I There's agree. something I, about I, it where you walk out of there, and you're like, I feel like I got. Yeah, you, right you now. might as well just gone to like a Hard Rock Cafe and save save the trip, <laughs> save the money. Yeah, no, it's a little better than Hard Rock Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they get a lot of shit uh, these uh, these past few years because they're inducting people who quote unquote aren't rock and roll. When you eventually get Eddie Vedder on here, maybe we can have that discussion with him, but we haven't had him on yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're, we're going to get Ed on at some point. You yeah, say that to me. We'll, you know, we'll ask time. him. Dude, I went, to, I went to their induction, Pearl Jam's induction, and we had – it was incredible. They I'm went sure. in with Yes, I think, Yes, and a couple other people. I bet Eddie – is Eddie in by himself yet? Because they do that to people because he's going to go in by himself too. No, but he should be in by himself. Too. Right. He will. I'm, I'm sure he will. But he's not – I don't think he's in by himself yet, but he will definitely go in by yeah, himself. Yeah, no, like because I think Bruce is in, but also the East Street Band is in. It's a very different kind of Yeah. Thing. Yeah, dude, I got I got it. He's torn right now. I can't. I gotta go see him. Who? Bruce. 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 Uh, I keep seeing yeah. seeing images of like people going to the different kind of shows. Apparently, he is just non-stop energy from the moment oh, he starts to the moment he ends. Incredible, the dude. Other- Pearl Jam just announced the tour too. Whenever, whenever they announce the tour, I always get texts from buddies. Hey, man, looks like Pearl Jam's got any chance so we can get it. I'm like, I just ghost people. <laughs> Oh, dude, I'm sure you get you get you probably get overloaded with that more than like so tickets good. when you're play, dude. The other the one last one I gotta see, Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks are playing together. Oh, dude, let's go, bro! Okay. I want to go to that. I know. People can figure that out. I'm gonna look There's so many out. things we gotta see. We gotta see Corielli. Yes, and <laughs> Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of field trips we gotta plan together. All right. Oh, dude, wait, wait. Did I tell you I saw uh, uh, Frank Caliendo last week? No. Where? Oh, dude, I forgot. I saw this the past weekend. I saw Frank. I can't believe we're going a whole week. What? Dude, I saw Frank Caliendo, my buddy Bill Crawford at the DV Morning Show. So good. Yeah. Crawford's one of the best stand ups. Crawford opened for him, and then Caliendo went. We went backstage, said hi to him. Really nice guy. Dude, that guy's a genius. Absolutely. That guy is a genius with his impersonations of like Trump and Biden. Oh, forget. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Morgan Freeman. It was incredible. The Morgan Freeman one. He read somebody's like apology email, uh, like apology letter, like the a player that screwed up in Morgan Freeman's voice once. Google it at home. Watch, watch okay. it on YouTube. It's one of the funniest things ever. Sounds exactly oh like God. Morgan Freeman. He's great. Incredible. He's Incredible. the best. Anyway, all right. We'll go get to Cleveland. Right, drive by the, uh, drive by the Hall of Fame, but you don't have to go in since you've been there. Yeah. If I go in, I'll let you know. Yeah. I'll send a picture. <laughs> all right. All right, bro. All right, have bro. A great weekend. Love you. Have a great. Have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday. All right. Sounds good. Hey, good luck. Keep grinding on the draft, bro. Thanks, brother. Thanks.